want to talk about right here is about what it means to be building a movement. Building a movement for social justice and for freedom. In which the focus of our interests are drugs. People are always asking us, you know, you know, who are we? Who are we the drug policy reform movement? Well, like this. Like this. Three quarters of Americans say the drug war has failed. Three quarters of Americans also want to continue doing the same thing. They haven't been presented with another option. This gives us an incredible opportunity to point that out to them. Our drug laws don't work. What we're doing right now is not working, and more than it just not working, it's costing a ton of money and it's actually causing harm. Whether it's human rights, health, or the economy, everyone is affected by the drug war, whether they realize it or not. You know, right now in the United States, we're 5% of the world's population, we're 25% of the world's prison population. We rank first in the world per capita in the proportion of our population that's behind bars today. We lock up in America more people on drug charges, about half a million a year, than all of Western Europe locks up for everything. And they have 100 million more people than we do. So we are talking about the highest rate of incarceration in the history of democratic societies, the highest rate of incarceration in American history. And what's the number one thing driving that? The war on drugs. Make no mistake about it. The war on drugs is a real war with real human casualties. SWAT teams increasingly raid the homes of private citizens suspected of possessing drugs with paramilitary tactics, terrorizing family members, children, the elderly, and often targeting the wrong homes. The government even stoops so low as to arrest sick and dying medical marijuana patients. When the Women's Alliance for Medical Marijuana in Santa Cruz was raided, the feds literally handcuffed a terminally ill woman to her wheelchair. Civil asset forfeiture, wiretapping of private citizens, expansion of search and seizure laws, no-knock police raids, brutal interrogation techniques, mandatory minimum sentences, and racial profiling. All of these tactics started with the war on drugs. This is a disastrous public policy, arguably the worst since slavery. And as, as Mr. Fogg can tell you more than I can by a factor of a thousand, it is a war on people and mostly people of color. Certainly, the black community has been disenfranchised in so many ways by this war on drugs. Uh, we see one of the, one of the clear-cut uh, examples is crack versus powder cocaine, and it's mandatory minimums that is placed on crack cocaine. Uh, so the guy myself that was uh, operating in the drug uh, war, uh, I was told specifically that we couldn't go into certain aspects of the community, uh, the more affluent white areas of the community. We would stay to the weakest links. And when it comes to incarcerating African Americans, we incarcerate black men in America at a rate far higher than South Africa incarcerated black men under apartheid. One third of black men between the ages of 20, 20 and 29 is in jail, prison, on probation, or on parole, most of them for drug offenses. Let's be frank. White folks use 75% of the drugs in America. It happens to be the percentage of whites in the population. <laughs> now, if we make it easy for you to use drugs, you're going to use less or you're going to use more. <laughs> but you use the same amount as black people in Mexico. Blacks use between 12 and 13 percent of the drugs in America. We ought to know this because 75 percent of the people in the prisons in America are black and brown. Drugs have no inherently criminal or violent qualities to them. What causes the crime and the violence in the drug trade is the fact that it's a black market. I mean, when you have these alternate markets available, there's no method of resolving conflicts or enacting justice in them. So criminals who are running the markets themselves resort to these methods in order to get things done because they can't rely on the government or law enforcement to do this. When you put something into a criminal market, you make criminals rich. You put money into the hands of people that shoot people, put money into the hands of people that solve their problems with intimidation and violence. I mean, we have whole countries destabilized over cartels. I was 18 years in law enforcement, retiring as a police detective uh, near Lansing, Michigan. And that's why for 35 years and millions of arrests, this, this policy has gone nowhere. Drugs today are cheaper, 
stronger, and easier to buy than they were 35 years ago. And the prohibition model we're using now, as our grandparents did with alcohol, is a complete and total failure. Every time you see a 15-year-old being killed uh, who sold drugs in the street, that 15-year-old that did not die because of drugs. He died because of drug prohibition. People talk about we got to protect the kids, and if somehow we legalize marijuana, that's going to put kids at risk. And I say to them, why do you think the war on drugs is protecting our kids? Who in America has the best access to marijuana today? It's the kids. Who had the best access 10 years ago? The kids. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the kids. 10 years from now, the kids. In fact, when the adults say that we need a war on drugs, we need to keep pot illegal to protect the kids, the kids burst out laughing. In fact, I know people my age and they say, well, where can we get some marijuana? You know what the most common response is? Ask your kids. Further, if anything's a gateway, it's there because it teaches us that marijuana is just as bad as heroin and crack and cocaine. So the first thing it gets exposed to is marijuana. And you try it and you go, that's not that bad. They must have been lying about everything. I don't want to legalize marijuana or drugs because I want to get high. I can always do that. That's no problem. What I am sick and tired of is paying the federal government for it to pursue a policy which has been statistically proven in every way to be completely ineffective. The bottom line is it comes down to the war on drugs is not working. And we're asking this community, we're asking you, we're glad that the Students for Sensible Drug Policy is out there uh, making a difference and forming America, raising the conscious level that there are alternatives to this war on drugs. So if there isn't going to be a war on drugs, what do we tell families who are having problems with drugs? What is better for a family that's involved in drug abuse? If you can get in and work with them and help save that, solve that problem and save that situation, or if instead we take one of those members and stick them in prison, how does that help their family? One of the great ironies is that we've got the money to go out and arrest 800,000 people a year for marijuana offenses. Yet in most states in this country, if you have a serious drug addiction problem and you show up at a, uh, and, and want help, you get put on a long waiting list. We could be really helping those people, but instead we're spending money going out and ruining more people's lives. People can only be told to be afraid for so long before they say, okay, we've had enough. Now we want to face this problem, like we should have from the beginning, with courage, with strength, with understanding, by facing our fears. And that's where things are at right now. We're moving away from fear and toward understanding. We're very, very close to the tipping point of this thing. We don't have a lot of disagreement when it comes to really the basics with our, with our opponents. We have disagreement on a few minor matters of public policy. Minor matters. Because when it comes down to it, we all want to live in a good, safe world. And that's all it's about, right? Right. Hi, I'm Chris Crane. I'm the Executive Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. We're the largest student grassroots organization working to find alternatives to what we consider the failed war on drugs. Um, we are empowering students on college campuses all over the country um, to work to come up with alternatives to punitive drug war policies, in particular those policies that most negatively impact young people and students. So SSDP is an amazing opportunity and an amazing medium in which to communicate the faults and the flaws of current policies and show people that if we become motivated enough that we can make sure that the information that the federal government is spreading throughout the country to its citizens is accurate, that it's informed, that it's statistically and scientifically backed up, and that it's at least, if nothing else, based in common sense. The war on drugs has always been launched in the name of protecting young people. And I think because of that, it's really incumbent on us as young people to say, you know what, no more, not in our name, stop fighting this war in our name, and it's really up to us to put an end to this war on drugs once and for all. In fact, you know, you are here representing SSDP, and this conference is put on by SSDP, an organization that has 100 chapters or more nationwide, and is considered to be a credible source of information for both the national media and for Congress. Great to be here, and I thank all of you who are involved with the uh, Students for a Sensible Drug Policy. As you know, uh, in the last uh, few years, I've been working very closely with your representatives on Capitol Hill, as well as speaking out on issues that relate to uh, drug policies all across this country. So I want to thank you for your participation, because we all should be working together to bring about a change in this nation's drug policies. 
the war on drugs has increasingly become a war on youth. If you look at the uh, data out there about um, who is actually arrested for drugs in this country, it is predominantly young people. Over 50% of marijuana arrests in this country are for people under the age of 29 years old. We're targeting youth through, through uh, programs like random suspicionless student drug testing in public schools that treat all students as if they are uh, as if they're criminals, as if they are guilty until proven innocent. Um, we have the law like the HEA aid on the nation penalty that takes away financial aid from students with drug convictions. Uh, we have the Office of National Drug Control Policy um, paying for uh, propaganda ads um, that directly target young people with lies about drugs and drug policy. Because as things are currently standing, American students in particular, college students in particular, are the ones that are facing some of the greatest risks to their individual rights. Uh, things like the HEA aid elimination penalty that forfeits financial aid for any college student convicted of a, of a drug offense. That even something as vital and necessary and obvious as the right and need for a fair and equal education are being denied to us by the government. Where I was in school at the time, I was receiving financial aid for a majority of my tuition. Don't have uh, you know really rich parents or you know, I'm not you know independently wealthy so I get most of my aid from, from federal loans and that conviction did affect um, my eligibility for school you know when I had to tell hey guess what my parents I can't get financial aid to go to school anymore because of the, this they said say what now you know what is this <coughs> you know we had no idea that this existed. Uh, this organization was founded in 1998 basically on the issue of the Higher Education Act uh, drug provision. That's been the issue that we were founded on, was to try and stop uh, the federal government from taking away financial aid from students with drug convictions. And this year, we, along with our allies in the Cheer Coalition and many other organizations, convinced Congress to scale the law back, to remove the reach back effect, to remove its retroactivity so that students with prior drug convictions will no longer lose their financial aid as a result of those convictions. And because of that, Tens of thousands of students are now going to be able to go back to school who were not able to go to school last year. You know, we had a recent scaling back of a provision, uh, which uh, was a step in the right direction, but we have to do more. And denying the opportunity for higher education does not solve the nation's drug problem, nor does it provide drug treatment. It was your involvement that led to changes in the Higher Education Act earlier this year. And while those changes stopped short of the complete repeal that I and, and other members have sought, it's a significant step in a direction. Uh, the work that you do today and the people who you speak with, uh, in Congress and their staff, it's imperative that you're out there communicating. And in this next Congress, let's work together to repeal those provisions that create a whole class of offenders who really are, are very much in need of educational opportunities. They should not be precluded from such educational opportunities. And when we work together, we're going to repeal those laws. The largest study ever conducted to look at the effectiveness of student drug testing. Uh, 900 schools, 94,000 students were looked at. The study found that at each grade level studied, 8th graders, 10th graders, 12th graders, students that were drug tested used drugs in no different rates than the students that weren't drug tested. We make a mistake when we rely on randomized drug testing to prevent addiction and abuse of drugs. Instead of focusing our efforts on educating our children about drugs and engaging them in decisions about their lives and futures, drug testing assumes that all youth are the same. Randomized <coughs> drug testing renders all youth suspects. This year, the Office of National Drug Control Policy held a series of summits around the country uh, designed for school administrators and teachers to teach them how they can drug test their students in public schools. These are dog and pony shows put on by the federal government where they talk about why drug testing is great, why the science is perfect, and how you can go about getting money from the federal government to implement them in their school. They don't invite the opposition to be there, so we made a point of being at every single one of these summits. We set up SSTV tables with some help from, from Normal, from the Drug Policy Alliance, um, and we set up tables at every single one of these and we handed out our literature and we shook hands and we talked to the teachers and we talked to the administrators who were there and gave them our side of the story and I can't tell you how many of them came up to us and said, wow, I'm really glad that you guys are here. I really, I knew there was another side to this issue. I'm glad that you were here to present it to me and I really believe that we prevented a lot of school districts around the country from implementing random student drug testing programs. 
In my recent experience with SSDP, just since becoming a freshman in college this year, I've already learned an enormous amount of information about policies that I didn't even know existed. Uh, for example, I think it's interesting to note that the, the anti-drug commercials that are federally funded, that we see on television all the time, the, the ads that show kids smoking pot and then running over a girl on a tricycle, or the kid who shoots his friend in the face because he smoked a joint, that those ads are not only ridiculous and, and just illogical, but that government and federally funded commissioned studies have shown that they actually lead to increased use of drugs by American youth. That these drugs are, that are rather that these advertisements aren't just dumb and illogical, that they're actually ineffective. They're promoting drug use among, among teenagers and youth. Well, members of SSDP uh, get involved in actually changing policy. Um, one of our big campaigns is something we call the Campus Change Campaign, and that's uh, a campaign where we encourage our activists to try and change punitive drug policies on their campuses. I'm so impressed by everything that you guys are doing on campuses. I'm so impressed that, um, that you are willing to, besides all of your, your, your core study, create a, a society at your campus, which is one that you want to live in. Passion is about half of activism. The other half that we cannot forget is that we are, we're creating something while we're tearing something down. The organization is critically important and the kids are critically important because they're the D.A.R.E. generation. They're the voice um, that says what we're currently doing isn't working, that D.A.R.E. and other drug education, conventional drug education isn't working, we need something better. I think that Students for Sensible Drug Policy is perhaps the most important organization in the drug policy reform movement. That organization, of course, is the future. The reality is that there are now thousands of young people who are involved in this effort. And the fact that you were willing to mobilize and use your energy to lobby Congress on this issue this weekend really speaks to how we've become a more effective movement than we were just a decade ago. And I remember sitting, you know, long nights with folks from early SSDP days and thinking about what it might be like to have a, a real student drug policy reform movement that was burgeoning and, and bold and bursting at the seams. And lo and behold, 10 years later, here we are, 2007, Washington, D.C., and we're bursting at the seams. As young people, especially um, in a college setting, we have a particularly, ex a particularly influential role to play in the push for serious drug reforms. Um, we can see historically throughout American history that it's been the young people that have promoted and enacted the most influential, positive, and powerful changes in our society, whether you're talking about the civil rights movement or any number of other social justice movements throughout our history. It's been the young people, the people who are coming across these newly recognized sense of rights, realizing that they're being abused, and recognizing the need for change. And that is what makes uh, a, a any social justice movement succeed. None of them have ever succeeded without a big, bold student movement. And here we are. We've got it, we're growing, and we're taking over. I think that SSDP has the tools, the young people, to create change in this country like never before. If the 18 to 27 year olds voted in the 70 percentile, there would be a political revolution in this country. And I think that SSDP is one of the premier organizations in the country in and around not only drug policy, but basic human rights. On my personal level of experience, SSDP has just really just been awesome. Uh, I've met a lot of great people, a lot of really smart people that I'm just humbled to even be in their presence. It's basically like being around a bunch of walking encyclopedias on drug policy because everyone is so well informed that after spending even a matter of minutes or hours with people who are, have been in SSDP for several years, you start to realize that this is not an organization of students who just like to smoke pot or students who like to recreationally, recreationally use drugs. It's an organization of students who are seriously concerned about the stability of their individual rights as American citizens and who are intellectually capable of making sure that they will do whatever they can to ensure that those rights are protected and preserved by the federal government. It's about what you believe. You're not here because you want to have a party. You are here because you want to change the laws. You're not changing the laws because it's a goddamn college project. 
you are not involved in this debate because you want to get a merit badge for forensics. You're doing this because you believe in something positive. You believe in something correct, better than what we've got now. The passion of your beliefs, the passion of your convictions, that is what wins. That's what gets people's attention. That's what gets them to understand that you really mean this. Through joining this organization, we can help to inform and help other people realize that um, that we as college students are really at the greatest risk to lose or have these rights abused. But if we band together, if we become motivated and mobilized, we can ensure that the federal government is actually doing its job. And that being the administrative responsibility of preserving those constitutionally guaranteed rights to us as American citizens, not just as students, but as citizens of this country. I would urge, as I did with my own kids, my, my two children and now in their 20s, to join SSDP, to become part of a chapter if it exists, if it doesn't exist, to start one. This is perhaps the most important, newest social political movement in America today, and I can't think of a better way to get young people involved. It's just so, so great to be involved with with Students for Sensible Drug Policy. I have made the best friends of my whole life in my chapter. I mean, everybody, we hang out, we go to meetings, and it's almost just like, hey guys, we're all gonna get together at six tonight, and we're just gonna designate an hour or so to talk about drug policy issues instead of you know watching TV or something. We get together and have dinner all the time, and we go out to events, and you just meet so many great people, not only on your chapter, but at other schools. And now I have you know good friends in Canada and Texas and you know California, and just from all over the United States and Canada, there, there's people like us everywhere, and you shouldn't feel like that you're alone in this if you if you really feel passionate about um, changing drug policies you know this is the this is the place to do it in SSDP I do what I love for a living because I got involved with SSDP when I was in college and I think a lot of people um, can uh, can take solace in that 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 there are going to be opportunities for them when they get out if they make a name for themselves on their campus none of you must now play the role that you or your chapters have in this thing each time you put on an event each time you hold a debate, each time you put up a flyer that is one incremental piece in this picture, it's a step that doesn't look like much to you now, but it's the littlest things that lead to the biggest change. The drug policy reform movement, we are essentially the new social justice movement on the block. We are the movement today that is growing faster than any other, that is fighting for individual freedom, that is fighting for social justice, that is fighting for fairness, that is fighting for compassion and public health and human rights. And we stand on the shoulders and follow in the footsteps of other movements for social justice that have preceded us. You know, with the gay rights movement, the movement for civil rights, the movement for women's rights, even the movement to abolish slavery and the slave trade. Every one of them were movements for freedom, individual freedom and social justice. Every one of them took on vested interests. Every one of them took on movements that played to people's fears about the women and children. Every one of them had to start with virtually no resources and claw their way to power. But ultimately they triumphed just as we will because what we're fighting for is right and because what we're fighting for is just. And I just want to say this, make it real simple. You either get involved or they will involve you. Yeah, I like that.